Okay, the recording will start soon. Um, let's um, take a moment, please, just to pray together and we'll get started. Could uh, somebody please pray with the class today? Can I pray? Go ahead, Divya, please. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Abba, for this uh, wonderful opportunity that you've given us. We invite you, Holy Spirit, into our midst. Lord, you open our hearts, our minds to receive your very words of truth. May it renew our minds, Lord. We uh, surrender our hearts, our soul, Lord, our will, our emotions, Lord, our spirit, Lord, that you may take it, Lord, and use it, uh, uh, Lord. You change it up uh, according to your uh, purposes in your will, in alignment to your word, your truth, Lord. We pray, Lord, that we be receptive uh, to uh, what you have to tell us, uh, Father, and we pray that your presence be upon uh, the pastor and each of the student, Lord, uh, that uh, we may be used mightily for your glory. You make us vessels of honor, Lord, for your name's sake. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to VC209, our course on holiness. We're kind of towards the end of this course and uh, hope to finish today or maybe next uh, next class, which will be on Wednesday. So we have been talking about overcoming, overcoming the the flesh the world and the devil because this is the challenge this is these are the things that keep us from living holy uh, walking in holiness uh, even though the god who has called us is holy and he has called us to holiness uh, the flesh the world and the devil pull upon the believer and uh, try to you know keep us prevent us from living a life of holiness and the fact is as long as we are on this earth as long as we are living in this natural body on the earth we're going to face we're going to face the pull of the uh, the, the, the the pull of the flesh the world and the temptations of the devil we're going to face it um there won't be any moment when you know all these things just go away well as long as we are in our natural body in this world in this time and so we have to be constantly constantly alert on guard uh, we must be aware how these things operate how does the flesh try to destroy the believer, I mean, pull the believer down. How does the world influence the believer? And what we are de dealing with now is how does the devil operate? So we started talking about this, the the, <clears throat> the last part, uh, overcoming the devil in our last class. Just going to quickly review a few things and we'll move forward. And uh, yeah, I will I will come to those questions. Uh, so chapter 7, Overcoming the Devil, uh, we said that there is an adversary, the devil, right? Uh, and uh, we have to, we are called and we have been empowered to overcome, to resist the devil successfully. But then in order to do that, we must become aware of his activities. How does he operate? We said, look, there are just four main things he does. I mean, if you broadly categorize what he does, you can put them in four big categories. One is he tempts us, second, he accuses us or uh, throws uh, accusations to condemn us, condemnation. He tries to deceive us, give us falsehood, and he comes opposes, uh, opposes us, uh, opposition. He tries to hinder us, do things to stop us. But in our overcoming of the devil, we must be absolutely certain that Satan is a defeated enemy. That's our position. The devil is defeated 
Christ won the victory, we are here to enforce that victory. Right? So we're not striving for victory. That was done for us on the cross. We're enforcing that victory. Okay. So the the bat the, the 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 way we engage is a little different. We're not trying to fight for victory. We are fighting from a place of victory, in order to enforce that victory. Saying, "Devil, you have been defeated. You're going to stay defeated in my life." So, uh, in order to do that, we must be aware of his tactics, how uh, how he operates. One big way is through mind games. Second is he looks for open doors. So obviously, if we want to live overcoming lives, we need to keep our doors closed to the enemy. Don't give him an opportunity. Sin uh, and doing wrong things obviously opens the doors. And so that's why it's so important to repent the moment we do something wrong. And thirdly, he violates. He tries to forcibly do things he knows he's not supposed to do. But this is where we put up our shield of faith and we say no. Devil, you, I know you're a trespasser, but no trespassing. I am not uh, going to give you the an opportunity to trespass. He will try to. That's when we resist. Number three, as part of our strategy in overcoming the devil, and this is so simple, and yet it's so important. We must be vigilant and give the enemy no opportunity. Right? That is our responsibility. And that is us taking our spiritual life seriously. Right? That we must be alert and uh, and know that hey, the enemy is going to use things around me to try to pull me down. So obviously, if I'm alert and I can think strategically, I'll just make sure he doesn't have the opportunity. We can be preemptive or preventive in many of these things. And let me say this, and I don't say it in any way to, to demean or disregard, but, you know, if we as believers will be wise, so be vigilant, be alert, but be wise. I mean, think strategically, think like a soldier. Think like somebody in the army. Be preemptive, be preventive. We can actually thwart the enemy even before he makes his move, that you make your move. You know, and if we as believers do that, I think we can, you know, we can really live victoriously on the earth. The Bible, you know, in talking about Jesus, John 14, you know, Jesus makes the statement. He says, the ruler of this world is coming. Of course, that he's referring to the devil. But look at what he says. He has nothing in me. Now, that's so, so wonderful. The ruler of the world is coming. The devil's coming. But he has nothing in me. You know, it's, there's nothing in me. He can claim there's nothing in me that he can have access to. He's coming, meaning, of course, Jesus is in the world. The devil is around. He's going to try to do his part. The devil is going to try to tempt Jesus. He's going to try and, you know, whatever, test, attack him in all points, just like as we are. But Jesus said he has nothing in me. No foothold, no access point, no entry point, nothing. And so, if we can live like this, then while the devil around us is trying and his demons are trying to do their thing, play their mind games or look for entry points or try to intrude, we say, sorry, you have nothing in me. I'm like Jesus. I walk like Jesus. You have nothing in me. The Apostle Paul told us, he said in Ephesians 4, 27, it says, don't give any place to the devil. Literally in the Greek, it means don't give the devil any foothold, any landing place. You can't even put his foot down in anywhere in things that concern you. No foothold. Don't give any place to the devil. Now, that's our responsibility. So if we can live 
with that mindset, I'm not going to give the devil any foothold, any place to land his foot on in my life. We, it's like half the battle is over. We are preventing a lot of things. Sadly, men, you know, if we leave so many entry points to the devil and the devil is landing, uh, the devil and his demons have so many places to land, then we've got a lot of battles to fight. Yeah, fighting here, fighting there, fighting there, fighting there. Hey, why don't you just close all the doors? Don't give the devil any place to land. If he's coming, he's going to be on the outside. We can't prevent him from coming. But he comes and he finds no entry place. You just keep going about your business. And like Jesus, you can say, the devil comes, but there's no place. He comes looking. Where's the entry point? No place. So that's a, a, a great way to live our lives. That's a commitment to holiness. That's a commitment to living a life that pleases God. And when we see him coming, our response is resist the devil. So we can't prevent him from coming, but we can prevent him from having a landing place. And we resist when he comes. So in view of this, you know, we keep every area of our life in submission to the Lord. We will, full, we will feel the pull, the pressure of our flesh, the pull and the pressure of the world, and the temptations that the enemy tries to place around us. But we are committed to holiness, committed to sub, living, living in submission to the Lord, so we give no place to the devil. And Part of this is our words. You know, we should be careful of the words we speak. Uh, be careful of our tongue. Our words are important. Our words pledge our allegiance to God. And our words are important. So use your words. You know, watch against sin. Don't give sin any place in your life. I'm just pointing out a few things here that we could be careful about. Don't get into strife with anybody. Uh, you know, there will be always opportunity to get in strife, or strife or envy or selfish interest. These things are detrimental. They just open the door to confusion and every kind of demonic work. So we be careful against strife. Right? So we conduct ourselves in such a way that the that even people uh, who are opposed to the gospel have no chance to speak. You know, so Paul writes in Timothy, he says, you tell the young people, younger widows, and so on, to live in such a way they give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So whether it is people who are adversary, adversarial to the gospel, or whether it's even uh, the enemy trying to use an opportunity. So like, you live in such a way that the adversary, whether people or the enemy, Satan, they have no chance to speak. No chance. So a lot has to do with this, being vigilant, giving the enemy no opportunity. I think, think, be wise, think very strategically, think like a military person, and you preempt or prevent what the enemy would try to do. And lastly, of course, God has given us spiritual weapons. He's not left us here just to try to do things on our own. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 talks about our spiritual weapons. You know, take on, the Bible says, you know, take, uh, take, uh, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy. So put on the full armor. God's given us the armor, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth our feet shod with the um, uh, preparation of the gospel, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit. He's just given us everything. So he says, you know, go use it. And if you do that, he says, having done all to stand, stand. That means when we do our everything to stand, we will stand. The enemy is not going to knock us down. 
we can stand. God's given us the weapons. And we can demolish the mind games that the devil plays, right? So 2 Corinthians 10, chapter, chapter 10, verses 4 through 6, with the weapons God's given us, we cast down imaginations, we, can, we pull down strongholds, we bring every uh, reasoning and imagination that's contrary to God, pull it down. We take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So the mind gives, the devil is going to come and play those games, but we have the weapons by which we counteract and we neutralize everything the enemy attempts to do in our minds. So we have to use those weapons. Now, if as a believer we don't use our weapons, now God is not going to come and do that for us. Right? God has given us the weapons, we have to use it. Now, of course, we can support one another because we are an army. We can, you know, help each other. We can assist and aid each other. And God will uh, come to our assistance. But we've got to use the weapons God has given to us. And we're not getting into this, but we all know that we have the right to use the authority of Jesus' name, the power of the word of God, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is on our lives. We, uh, we declare what the blood of Jesus has done for us. We put on the full armor of God. Praise and worship stops the enemy. It stills the avenger. And through prayer and intercession, we counter what the enemy is doing. So all of these are things God has given to us. And we make use of these things and we intentionally, meaningfully engage in battle. So. Overcoming the enemy, overcoming Satan. And I've, I've put it, it looks very, very simple, four points. <laughs> but I think they are just simple, and yet they're very important. You know, know that the enemy has been defeated. Be aware of his tactics, how he operates. From our side, be vigilant and try to always stay in a place where the enemy has no opportunity. You know, stay in that secret place. Stay in that place where... He has nothing. And when he comes, when he tries to intrude, when he tries to violate, use the weapons. Use the spiritual weapons God has given to us. So our goal is in this course, learning about the holiness of God, our goal is to Live the overcoming life, a victorious life over sin and the flesh, the pressures of the world, and over Satan. So we must know every believer can live victorious over the flesh, the world, and the devil. You, as a believer, can live victorious. That must be in your mind. You know, don't embrace the notion that you cannot be victorious. Don't tolerate that thought. Don't embrace any idea that says, well, as long as you're in this world, you're going to be a victim. You're going to suffer under the hand of the enemy. You're going to be trapped by the weaknesses of your flesh. You know, don't have that poor negative mindset about the Christian life. The Christian life is one of victory. Overcoming, you are an overcomer, and God has given us what we can overcome. So that should be our mindset. I can live a victorious life over whatever I'm facing. Right? And then we must, of course, be determined, make a determined effort to walk victorious. Take the word of God, take what the, the, the things God has given to us, and say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to live victorious. I'm going to fight the good fight of faith. I'm going to press in to the things God has made available to me in the kingdom. I'm going to take it by force and I'm going to walk in what God has provided for me in the kingdom. So in closing, we want to answer the question, you know, why live an overcoming life? Why is it even important? Why should I, you know, I, I, it takes effort uh, conscious spiritual effort. So why? Well, three simple reasons. Because we want to delight the Father's heart. 
And we want to please his heart. And uh, living overcoming life is living a life of holiness. And that pleases. It delights the Father's heart. Right? It delights the Father's heart. The apostle said, you know, we want to be well pleasing to him. You know, we want to be well pleasing to him. And of course, he is conscious that one day we'll have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Yes, it is there. There is that sense of fear and responsibility. But the bottom line is that the, the underlying motivation is I want to be well pleasing to God, I want to please His heart. So you, you and I make choices, we make decisions that are easy. Secondly, we want to reveal Jesus to the world. You know, how can we show the world the reality of, of, of being a Christian, of following Jesus Christ? Um, you know, if, if, if we live defeated lives, how will people get the fragrance of his knowledge? If you look at 2 Corinthians 2.14, he says, Thanks be to God. He leads us in triumph in Christ, you know. And it says, in that context of leading us triumphantly in Christ, through that, there is the diffusing of his knowledge in every place. You know, sometimes, and I, I don't want to say this in a demeaning way, but I think it's a misrepresentation that's happening in the church where people say, okay, through, our, you know, God's grace, through our sinfulness, all of that, okay, the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. No, 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 no. It is through us walking triumphant in Christ that, God is diffusing the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. That must be very clear. That's what the scripture says. Now, it is, yes, a person may be in terrible sin or terrible weakness or bondage, but how is the fragrance of his knowledge going to be diffused when that person comes out and overcomes that weakness, overcomes that bondage and breaks free from that bondage and by the power of Christ and overcomes that weakness as we come out as triumphant in those situations through the empowering of God. That's what's going to diffuse the fragrance. So we, we must be very clear. This is what the Bible says. That is through us being triumphant in Christ, there is that fragrance revealed or released to the world. And so God, let my life release that fragrance. But I need to triumph. I need to show that we can overcome. I need to demonstrate by my life that a living, a victorious life in Christ is available. So reveal Jesus to the world. And third reason, very important reason, why we need to over live, as, live this victorious, overcoming, holy life in Christ is so that we can be fruitful for the kingdom of God. And this is a passage we've seen before that um, as we add to our faith, virtue and knowledge and all these other things, it's going to bring us to a place where we, can, we will not be barren or unfruitful. Or if you want to restate it in a positive statement, we will be fruitful and uh, uh, you know, bear much fruit in our knowing Christ. But it is as we add to our faith, virtue and knowledge and brotherly love and so on, you know, that means we're growing in these areas that's going to cause us to be fruitful in knowing Christ. So that's the motivation. That's why we seek to live a holy life. That's why we desire to live an overcoming, a victorious life. Because we want to delight the Father's heart. We want to reveal Jesus to the world. We want to be fruitful for the kingdom of God. You know, and I, and, and I feel really sad uh, as you see what's going on all around the world. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not saying be we have we can do much about this but then when we see you know great 
now what to say great, but uh, renowned, well-known Christian leaders whom the world sees. See the world. When they look at Christ, the Christian world or the, the, the Christian Christendom in the world, the unsaved, look at the Christendom. They only see the big names, uh, the big name pastors, the pastors of big churches and big movements. And when things happen, in the lives of these well-known, renowned leaders, it brings a big stain to Christendom. And uh, it is sad. But then that's the opinion the world gets. And you can't blame them because these people are in the forefront. These people in many ways are representing what Christendom is all about to the world. And sadly, that's all they, the world can see or understand. And that, you know, that just shows how important it is for us, especially for us in leadership, for us who are representing Jesus or are, are, the, are the face of the Christian, Christian church to the world, how important it is for us to, you know, live holy and to show that, you know, yeah, we can live victorious lives. It's a tremendous responsibility and, you know, we need to, Fulfill that. So we come to the end of this course on uh, holiness. We divided this course into three sections. The first one was just understanding the holiness of God, trying to get a vision of that, how holy God is, and how His holiness pervades every aspect of who He is and it undergirds every facet of his nature. Secondly, we talked about repentance, uh, how repentance is important in the life of the believer. Uh, we, we, we never stop being in a place where we could, we, where we will repent if something is wrong, we repent. We should acknowledge, turn away, confess and turn away from our sin. And thirdly, we talked about overcoming, just the practical side, how to live the overcoming life. God has given us the tools. Actually, it's very basic. It's his word and his spirit. By the word and by the spirit, every believer can overcome. Don't make it complicated. It's all available to all of us. And with the help of the word of God and the Holy Spirit, we can overcome our flesh. We can overcome the influences of the world. And we can overcome the works of the devil against us. So in closing, I just want to put before us, especially those of us who are going to prepare for leadership or preparing for Christian leadership, you know, um, many of us are going to be leading churches, leading ministries. We're going to be in places of responsibility. And there are going to be a lot of other people looking up to us going to be you know watching our lives and um, even the world meaning people the unsaved are going to watch you and me and you and I many of us will become the face of the church or will become the face of Christ to those who are looking so I just want to leave us with this with this deep sense of responsibility that holiness is not an option. And we have to be determined till the last day of our lives to live holy. Never take it lightly. It's not a, it's not a very favorite subject. You don't find too many people preaching sermons on holiness. Uh, you may not get a lot of, you know, a big crowd listening to sermons on holiness, but you know, this is foundational. This is this is what we stand on, and if we mess up here, everything God does through us could be tarnished could, 
you know, could uh, could mess up. So I I don't have words enough to convey how serious this is, how important this is. Um, the life of holiness for every one of us, especially for those of you who are uh, preparing to serve God some way or another, because a lot of people are going to watch you. A lot of people are going to look at you. And if we fail in this area, no matter how much good we do, people will forget the good and they will talk about our mistakes. They will talk about our failures. That's sad, but that's how the world is. So all I can say is, till our last breath, we have to be committed to being holy before God. Okay, let me take the questions um, in the chat before we close. Um, Anita's question. Why did God put devil and mankind on earth? This is something uh, we can try and think about. There's an interesting book that was written quite some time ago. Uh, I, I would encourage you to. Uh, I'm just putting the. I'm putting it on the chat. It's a book called Destined for the Throne by a man named Paul Bilheimer. I think it was written, I forget the year, that must be in the 80s. It's a small little book, but it's pretty, very good, very good. And it's very insightful. Uh, and he shares, you know, he, he's asking the same question that you asked. You know, what is, what is, why are we here, the church? Why is God letting the devil be around? What is all this working towards? And and I just want to summarize. I mean, you can read the book, but if you summarize it, basically the idea is the church is being prepared and God is using the devil. Using the devil means he's not making the devil do what he's doing, but he's like, okay, devil, you do what you want to do, but everything you do is going to help the church become better. And it's going to make the people of God be what he wants. So it's like our training ground, you know, it's like our practice time. Uh, it's us, uh, you know, using what God has done for us in Christ to overcome the devil and actually prepare us for a life uh, of reigning with Christ, uh, both in the millennium and beyond. So that's an interesting I would say it's a spiritual insight from the Word of God. It's it's all backed up by Scripture. Uh, while the Bible doesn't state it explicitly, we can infer from Scripture that this is what God is doing. So I would just share that with you. Okay. Um, Samuel, some practical ways to be preemptive. Do we anticipate the enemy's attack beforehand? Yeah. So that's a good question, and the answer is yes. Right. So you think strategically for example i'll tell you a very simple simple thing that happened this you know, that was just this morning uh, over the weekend um uh, my wife ab and i we had gone to mangalore uh, mangalore is uh, it's not too far from bangalore it's about uh, we took the flight to mangalore and you know we went there this weekend to minister mainly because of a leadership change uh, paul and diana who've been serving there for uh, four years, uh, they are moving to Bangalore to take care of one of our churches here. And John Paul and Glads uh, were appointed to pastor uh, the church in Mangalore. So that's what happened this weekend. So we went there to do that and explain to everybody, you know, this is what's happening, so on. So we did that. I came back, and then you know, this morning I was thinking maybe I should send an email to everybody in the congregation in Mangalore. And that's a very simple thing. I'm just trying to give you how to think. Maybe I should send an email or a mass message saying that, hey, you know, thank you, thank you all for your support, and you know, just to uh, you know affirm, you know, what they're doing, etc. And then give them my 
my mobile number and email ID and say, hey, if you if you want to do, if you want to reach out, reach out anytime. So I was, the thought went through my mind. But immediately, and I, as I was thinking about, look, it's 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 a very naive thing, nothing complicated. I'm just sending an email to the congregation in Mangalore, you know, blessing them and thanking them, etc., and giving them my, a warning to give my number and email and just say, hey, feel free to contact, you know. But so that's that's a very innocent thing to do. But uh, here's the other thought: if I do that, how will it affect? the leaders we have put in place. People, what we really want is, we want the congregation to connect with the leaders we have put in place. And that is, now of course, it's uh, John, Paul and Glads. We want them to connect with them. And we want to empower John, Paul and Glads. And, and we want them to be the leaders. And we want them to go forward. Yeah? But if I... By, do, by sending an email and saying, hey, feel free to contact me, in some way, I will be circumventing that. And in some way, I will be maybe even undermining that leadership. See, we're all one team, but I have to think, I must strengthen the leaders. I must not promote myself. So the, that congregation in that city must connect very strongly with the leaders we've put in place. Okay, very simple thing. So I said, okay, I'm not going to send that email. I won't do it for this reason. Why? I need to stay out of the picture. The congregation must learn to connect and they, that leadership there, they must be strong. I don't want to do anything, even it's an innocent thing to in any way dilute that relationship okay so it's a very innocent thing very simple thing but i am thinking because if i do something very innocent like this just send an email to the congregation in that city hey you know it under in some way dilutes the leadership and the enemy could use a good thing for wrong reasons. So we have to think strategically, right? What what are we what do we want? We don't want people to be dependent on or connected to past ashes. We want them to connect to the leadership there and they have to be strong together and they have to advance. And so that's how we should think. And I'm just so I said, okay, I'm not gonna do this. Right. So that's a very simple example. It's very naive. I mean it's very, very innocent, but there is wisdom. And this is also being preventive or preemptive, you know, uh, in, in how we function as churches and ministry and so on. We have to think. Otherwise, an innocent action could give the enemy an opportunity. We are innocent, but we are not wise. So we need to be innocent, pure, but we also need to be wise. Right? I hope I got uh, explained that. So this is a simple example. And uh, now uh, in many things, in our personal lives and how we order so many things in our lives, all of those things, we have to be very careful, be wise, how you go about things so that, you know, we basically be smarter than the devil. Okay. Um, any other questions before we wrap up today. So this will be our last class on the course on holiness. I will work on the uh, assessments, put them out, and we can work on it through the rest of April. We have a couple of maybe four weeks and um, and uh, continue to think about this, review the notes, uh, strength, establish this in your life. And uh, yeah, okay. Fine, if there are no more questions, we will uh, close in prayer and uh, we will dismiss. All right. Okay. Let's, uh, I hope all of you benefited from this course and, um, uh, you know, that you carry the. Um,
Kennedy question, any materials to read further on holiness? Um, now, if you, if you do a search, um, if you do a search on books on holiness, um, I would, you know, you would find, for instance, um, there's a book, I think, by R.C. Sproul. Um, there is, and uh, I kind of forget anything. Um, so if you just do a search, Google's own books on holiness. Now, some of these books uh, may be a little, um, uh, see, one of the things um, I, I like to do is to, keep the content very practical like how do you live it out so there are a couple of books on holiness written by good uh, christian authors uh, you can you can get them online you can read them uh, 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 and maybe i would even recommend this book holiness holiness truth and the presence of god by Francis Angie Payne. Yep. That's another book. That's a good book, Francis, Holy Truth in the Presence of God, Francis French Payne. So uh, th these are good resources you could find online. And if you can get your hands on them, I'd encourage you to read it. Um, but what I've tried to do in this course is um, take scripture, put it together, and also keep it very practical. Sometimes some books become very theological in content and then drawing the practical application is like it's a little difficult but hopefully we've been able to bring some truth uh, bring truth together and also uh, make it practical but i'll encourage you to look uh, definitely you know read uh, additional books and uh, do, do a study in scripture on holiness and take it forward all right, I would um, welcome anyone to invite any one of us to please pray and we will close uh, and dismiss. Shall I pray first? Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you, Father God Almighty. Our hearts are full of gratitude, Father, for you. What you say, Father, you do, the author and finisher of our faith. You lead us, Father. You lead us to walk in holiness. You draw us closer to you, Father. And the way you have led us, Father, through this course, we are so very, so very thankful to you, Abba Father, from the bottom of our hearts for bringing us to this day when we have completed the course, Father. And as we, as we, what we have learned, Father, as we live in it, Father, as we apply it to our lives, Father, we ask you the wisdom, the grace, the strength, and Lord, Father, your leading, your guidance of the Holy Spirit to do your will on this earth. And Father, glorify you, please you in all our ways, in all our walks, Father. All the weaknesses we lay at your feet. And Father, we declare that in your, in your presence, we will go, Father, and do the work for which you've called us, Father. And we thank you for Pastor. We thank you that he was, Lord Father, teaching us so beautifully how to live a life of holiness of our Father. We thank you for everything that we have learned and everything that you want to lead us into, Father. We thank you that we can lean on you. We can trust you in days to come, Father, as Lord Father, you use us for your glory in all ways. Bless every mm -hmm. student who is part of APC Bible College, all the teachers and everyone, Father and give us the wisdom and knowledge of your love, your, your truth, and your word, Father, so that in all things we may glorify you. Once again, we thank you. We, once again, we thank you, Father, for, from, from the bottom of our hearts, Father. We give you glory, honor, and praise, for you deserve it all, our Father. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we ask and pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. I see... Um... Yeah, Anita has a question about the certificate. Yeah, yeah, you know, we'd encourage everyone to continue and do your third year. Uh, now, if you cannot do your third year online, you can always use the e-learning platform. Um, you'll be just record listening to the recorded videos, lectures. 
uh, and you'll get the same certificate as uh, any anyone, whether you're doing in person, uh, on campus, online, or through the e-learning portal. You'll get the same certificate, and uh, in case you're not able to complete third year, then of course you can request um, a, a two-year certificate, and uh, you know we'll happy be happy to send that to you. So there's flexibility. Uh, but I definitely will encourage you to do the third year because the third year we do a lot of practical things about church administration, about um, you know, we do book study, studying the Bible, uh, chapters in the Bible, uh, books in the Bible in depth. So that's very useful. And we do a lot of practical stuff, um, practical things. So uh, I'd encourage you to uh, finish your third year. And also, like I mentioned, um, I, one of our earlier things, uh, we are setting up APC World Missions and also uh, another Pastors and Ministers Fellowship. So APC World Missions is where we are going to you know, try to help people in the ministries. Uh, we re really are looking for people who would finish three years with us because then we know you've got the full training and then we could really you know, um, uh, invest in whatever you're going to do, whether start a church or whatever ministry. So that's that's something to keep in mind. Now we're going to get ourselves, we're getting ourselves organized, uh, but then APC World Missions really is going to help people who finish three years with us so that, because we know, uh, you know, you've got the third year training as well, uh, which is very important, okay? So do your best, however, whichever option you want, whether you can do on per in-person, online class, e-learning, it's all the same, but please do try and finish the three years, uh, okay? God bless you all. I'll see you again soon. Bye now. Thank you so much, Pastor. We are really blessed. Thank you.